October 25th, 1944. American pilots from Taffy 3's small carriers take flight in a desperate attempt to stop the Japanese center force from annihilating their ships. These fighters and dive bombers are armed for ground attack and anti-submarine duty. Their weapons are virtually useless against the giant Japanese ships. Many of them armed with nothing other than depth charges or machine gun bullets, in some cases almost, almost nothing at all. And their job is to bear down that center force and do something, anything, to prevent their carriers from being run down like dogs on a highway and slaughtered by these massive ships. Lieutenant Richard Roby flies with a division of FM-2 Wildcat fighters from the escort carrier Gambier Bay. The 24-year-old pilot maneuvers his fighter through a maelstrom of flak. You don't get scared. You get scared afterward, not, not during. Roby noses over from 1,200 feet strafing Japanese destroyers with his 50 caliber machine guns. I aimed at the torpedoes, which are midships, because if I put the torpedoes out of existence, that put them basically out of existence. Soon, sister escort carrier groups Taffy 1 and 2, located 30 miles to the south, scramble their Wildcats and Avengers to assist. By 7.15 a.m., hundreds of Allied aircraft fill the sky. Their courageous efforts succeed in forcing the Japanese ships into defensive maneuvers. This break in the attack allows the destroyers Hull and Hearman to launch torpedo strikes. Hearman's torpedoes miss their intended target, but streak toward Yamato. The Japanese flagship turns hard to avoid the incoming threat. From the cockpit of his FM-2 Wildcat, Richard Roby spots the retreating Japanese flagship and moves in with his 50 calibers. I started shooting at the anti-aircraft positions on the foredeck because they're unprotected. They're just out in the open. But then eventually I got to the point I couldn't bear on them because I was too low. That's when I shot at the bridge. I stopped firing because I ran out of ammunition. Surprisingly, after the air and torpedo assault, Yamato does not rejoin the fight. But Kurita's center force still wields plenty of deadly firepower. At 7.35 AM, the tiny American destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts enters the fray. She heads out on a torpedo run towards the heavy cruiser Chokai. Under cover of smoke, Roberts advances to within two and a half miles of Chokai. We can see his two front eight-inch gun turrets turning toward us. And I swear to God, it looks like he was coming right, right between my eyes. Chokai fires eight-inch projectiles, each weighing nearly 300 pounds. But Roberts has moved so close, the Japanese cruiser can't train her guns low enough. The shells fly overhead. Roberts sends three 24-foot-long Mark 15 torpedoes, knifing through the water at Chokai they score a direct hit on the heavy cruiser. We didn't know any better, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. We were cheering like it was a baseball game. Then, Roberts lashes out with her only remaining weapons. We started now dueling with them with our two five-inch gun. That's all we had left. A five-inch shell would bounce right off their hull. So our two gunners we're aiming at the upper works. For 60 incredible minutes, Roberts slugs it out against adversaries 10 to 30 times her size. She fires more than 600 rounds of five inch ammo. But at 8.51 AM, 
Roberts shudders under the first of several devastating hits. We took a salvo of six eight-inch shells on the gun that's like mine up front, only in the back, 40 millimeter back. When the smoke cleared, we found out through our gun captain that 42 gun is gone, disintegrated, gone. We knew all our shipmates. I knew two, two boys pretty close in that gun back there. And all I could do was think of those guys, they're gone. And that's when we knew that this is it. This is a fight to the finish. In a furious last stand, the Roberts aft five inch gun, the only one left, sets the cruiser Chikuma's bridge afire and knocks out her number three gun turret. Moments later, three 14-inch projectiles from the battleship Congo impact the Roberts. A 40-foot hole is ripped open on her port side near the waterline. You could drive a semi-truck through there. And we're taking on water, tons of water were going in. Somebody yelled down, abandon ship, abandon ship, every man for himself. At 9.35 a.m., Yuzin and his shipmates abandon ship and pray for rescue. 30 minutes later, Samuel B. Roberts, the courageous ship known in Navy lore as the destroyer escort that fought like a battleship, slips beneath the waves. 89 sailors go down with the ship. The tin cans of Taffy 3 are succumbing to the withering firepower of the Japanese Armada. Now, the light cruiser Yahagi leads four destroyers on a torpedo run against the crippled flat tops. The only American ship in position to stop them is the battered USS Johnston. The Johnston opens fire with her few remaining five inch guns. Anytime we could get keyed in on something, we fired. And we kept firing as long as we, we could possibly could. Captain Evans orders Johnston to proceed full steam ahead, attempting to cross the T on the Japanese column. Crossing the T is a classic naval tactic, where a ship crosses in front of an enemy so she can fire all her guns, while the enemy can only fire its forward armament. But before Johnston can fully cross the T, Yahagi unexpectedly turns sharply to starboard. The destroyers follow. All of a sudden, they start turning one after another. Well, we had an idea then that something was up, and it was probably a torpedo attack. But their position was so bad that there was element of doubt. The Japanese fire their torpedoes. The Japanese Type 93 Long Lance is one of the most successful torpedoes of the war. With a maximum range of 20 miles and 1,000 pound explosive charge, it could sink a warship with a well-placed hit. As with all torpedoes, speed, range, and running depth must be preset. But the Johnston has caused the Japanese to fire prematurely before making proper adjustments. The torpedoes miss their mark. Again, Johnston has saved the carriers, and again, she pays the price. The five Japanese ships bear down on the lone destroyer. Johnston staggers fire among her attackers in a desperate but futile attempt to stave off the inevitable. At 9.10 a.m., a deadly fusillade rakes the ship. The early turning point was the gun 52 was hit, which is right in direct bridge. Well, it killed practically everyone in there, set five-inch ammunition cases on fire, clouds of smoke. Finally, Johnston's damaged engines falter and quit. She's dead in the water.
enemy destroyers encircle the crippled ship, firing relentlessly. The ship was just taking so many hits that uh, they couldn't patch holes fast enough and uh, just impossible to keep her afloat. At 9.45 a.m., two hours and 45 minutes into the battle, Captain Evans gives the order to abandon ship. 25 minutes later, the Johnston sinks beneath the waves. 186 of her crew are lost. But incredibly, Johnston and Taffy 3 have achieved the impossible. Admiral Corita has signaled the 20 undamaged ships in the center force. Return home. Thanks to the determination and courage of the American sailors and airmen, MacArthur's invasion force at Leyte is safe. The battle is over. David has felled Goliath.